Good morning, Gareth. Give me a second here to hey. not run over any felines and then we go. Sure, they would appreciate that, not being run over. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, I feel it's more that they that they they don't have the same appreciation for not being run over that they have a lack of appreciation for being run over. Right. All right. Um, so we have a couple minutes. I'll give people time to filter in. Cool. I see terminal mages here. How's everything, Eric? You're doing network automation now, right? Nice. Well, that's awesome. All right. Um, let me stop a couple of minutes. Right. Okay. Yeah, I know when we'd had conversations with um, some of the CenturyLink guys previously, so um, I don't know if that's how you end up, ended up getting involved there or, or what Matt Flynn, I think, was was one of those guys. Ah, oh, cool. I had some very long conversations with him about uh, uh, setting up storage arrays for home labs and things. <laughs> that's funny. Yeah, no, that's that's how I got uh, that's how I got pulled into that. Nice. Okay, um, things really do come full circle, don't they? All right, so we hit the top of the hour. I will go through and um, um, I'll assume that everybody else is uh, is preparing themselves to pepper Tom Hatch with questions. So let's uh, get these things going. Um, just first to introduce uh, Gareth. Uh, if you haven't already either witnessed him um, covering, helping me cover for uh, for Gary Geeson in yesterday's uh, networking demo, um, Gareth is a senior member of the core team, um, has, is uh, an integral portion of, of a lot of our uh, deeper integrations with SALT and, and a lot of the things that we do here. Um, aside from that, I would say that he requires no introduction, particularly if you're working on the community side uh, and dealing with a lot of merge and pull requests, things like that. Um, Gareth is talented in a great many things. He also owns uh, a gopher snake uh, among other things. I will leave it at that. All right. Thank you, Patrick. Um, I am just realizing that, so this is my first time actually using PowerPoint web. I'm usually using, uh, Google slides and I'm just realizing that it doesn't have an option to let me see my notes. So if anyone has any, and nope, that's not what I want. Nope, nope, go away. Uh, nope, I don't want that. Probably should have checked this beforehand. All right, we'll just go. Uh, we'll go ad lib here. All right. So uh, for those okay. of you, if you're, what's that? I said you'll be fine. Okay. Yeah. Uh, no, uh, Max, there is not a presenter view um, from what I could see. Um, so I will uh, I'll hold my thoughts and my, my comments on, on PowerPoint for web uh, or just PowerPoint in general, I guess. Uh, anyway, so uh, let's get started. Uh, so those of you who are, if you're unaware, you are attending SaltConf at 21 right now. Um, just a huge thank you for everyone that's 
that's attending. Um, I, I will echo Tom's comments from his, his keynote yesterday. I don't want to be like yet another person to say like, I really miss everyone in person, but I really do miss everyone in person. Um, the conversations I had yesterday were, were fantastic, um, but it, it's just not the same as as being in person. So hopefully SolConf 2022, um, we'll all get to, to gather and, and uh, be together in person again. Uh, so this is uh, a talk on uh, customizing salt for fun and profit. Um, your your agenda uh, from uh, probably up until maybe yesterday or the day before um, said like TBD or TBA. Um, so I was kind of scrambling to to come up with a, a talk topic um, to kind of narrow the scope of what uh, what I wanted to talk about. Um, but I kind of settled on this um, just because we have some. Some cool additions that went into the uh, the silicone release, uh, which was released uh, about a week ago, um, that really make uh, having custom modules um, a lot easier and a lot more uh, manageable. So I really wanted to highlight that. Uh, so as Patrick said, um, uh, for those that don't know me, I am a senior member of the technical staff at VMware. I work on the Salt project. Um, uh, there's my Twitter accounts uh, and my GitHub accounts. Um, You've probably interacted with me uh, if you submit pull requests or issues into the pro into the project. Uh, and once again, like we're we're going to talk about customizing salt uh, for fun and profit. Uh, so just a, a quick agenda of what we're going to go through. Uh, we're going to go through an overview of the different types of salt modules, um, just to give everyone kind of an overview of of what what types of modules are available, what we can customize. Um, and just to kind of highlight some of the, the uses, um, especially some of the lesser known uh, modules uh, that don't get as much attention as as uh, some of the like uh, traditional uh, remote execution or, or configuration management modules. Uh, then we're gonna go through the uh, why, what, and how uh, for customizing salt. Uh, we'll look at some various uh, internal helpers available uh, when you're writing and, and uh, creating salt modules. And then finally, we'll look at uh, some some simple code examples of uh, some custom modules. Uh, so first thing I wanted to highlight was uh, virtual modules. Uh, so if you've used Salt at all, uh, you probably know that. <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, we have a concept of what's called virtual modules. Um, so what virtual modules let you do is uh, you can define. So a really good example of this is the package module. And so the package module uh, is actually uh, behind the scenes a collection of probably about half a dozen or more uh, different modules. Um, and depending on the system that you're running Salt on, the, the particular module will run. So if you're running it on a, a Debian or a Ubuntu machine, um, you will get a different package module than, say, like a Fedora or a Red Hat or an NTOS machine. Um, within those modules, the functions are as close, uh, as close as and similar as possible to make the experience uh, uh, as seamless as possible. Um, so you you can, if you're installing a package or removing a package using the package module, uh, you run the same command across a, a variety of hosts, and then you get uh, similar uh, similar results. Uh, so these are the types of modules. Um, and this is a small subset of of what's available. Um, I think there's about somewhere between 15 and 20 different types of, of modules um, that comprise SALT. Um, and a lot of them are not necessarily like user, uh, user specific or user facing. Um, uh, so, uh, but uh, this is like a small subset. And this is kind of the, what I, I kind of gleaned in, in my opinion, the, the major ones that people tend to, to use uh, when they're using SALT. And so we'll just go through them and, and kind of highlight some, uh, some interesting information about each one. So I'm sure like if you view Salt uh, for any length of time, you're probably familiar with uh, remote execution modules. And these are considered the heavy lifters of Salt. Um, so they're typically calling out to other programs and services, um, and they're used throughout the so Salt code base um, within all the other types of modules, um, within remote execution modules as well, um, to, to perform actions. And many of these are considered uh, what we consider core modules of Salt. Um, and what that what that means to me is if, if one of these modules, uh, many of them, if there's any breaking changes, excuse me, 
or something isn't functioning properly in them, then salt just simply doesn't function. Um, so some examples of this would be the, the CMD module, which is used extensively throughout other modules um, and the file module. And some examples of those modules here are, as I said, file, uh, CMD, Docker, um, and then the package module, which is a virtual module, uh, which could be uh, apt PKG, yum PKG, or FreeBSD PKG, P PKG, depending on the system you're running it on. So then we have state modules, um, and these are used for uh, like traditional configuration management. Um, and they're, they're responsible for ensuring that targets are in a specific state, um, hence the name state modules. And so if you're ever looking through the code or the available functions, you'll see a lot of functions that, that assume like a certain state. <coughs> Excuse me. So you'll see functions like present or absent um, versus like remote execution modules that typically have things like uh, like package install, whereas like in the state module for package, it would be package installed because it's, it's uh, setting the state of that particular package. Uh, so along with remote execution modules, these are some of the most used modules within SALT. And some examples of state modules that, that ship with SALT uh, include file, PKG, uh, the schedule, and uh, CMD. So then we have green modules. Um, and these are used to report information about uh, machines that are running SALT. And they're typically populated uh, or updated when, when the SALT minion starts. And they update periodically throughout uh, throughout the life cycle of a, a salt medium process. Um, they are they're considered uh, the data that's in them is considered uh, kind of long lived, um, so it doesn't it doesn't typically change often. Um, if you've ever used if you've ever used other uh, uh, similar systems to salt, such as like Puppet or, or Chef, um, they can be they can be thought of like Fax, uh, which is from the the Factor pro, uh, application or uh, attributes, uh, which is from Ohio, which Chef uses. Um, and some examples of grains that, that typically show up on a system uh, would be like your salt version, uh, your Python version, uh, your operating system details, as well as your networking details. Um, and as I said, like these, these type of details don't, don't typically change all, all that often. Uh, so next we have runner modules. Um, so on, on minions, when we're running commands, we use remote execution modules. Um, within the master or with, with, on the master, um, we use what's called runner modules. Um, and these are typically making calls uh, out to the mis master, or sorry, out to the minions or performing some sort of action on the, uh, on the salt master. Um, some, some examples of those include the jobs runner, um, which is useful for uh, querying and, and uh, interacting with the, the running or, or past jobs on your master. Uh, the state runner, which is used for uh, like orchestration jobs, or um, there's also the uh, the state event uh, function, um, which is good for like querying and seeing your event bus in real time, uh, as well as the event runner, um, which is useful for uh, adding events to the, uh, the, the salt master's event bus. So by default, uh, salt, mass, salt minions uh, will return all of their return data up to the salt master. Um, so sometimes it's uh, there could be a situation where you want to return it to some somewhere else um, in addition to or, or instead of the salt master. Uh, so that's when returner modules come in. Uh, so at, exactly as it says, like they they give the minion um, an option to or a way to return data up to the to some external systems such as the salt master. Um, so uh, some of the examples that we have are uh, like uh, MySQL um, or Elasticsearch and etcd uh, for sending them into like external systems for later usage, uh, later querying, um, or things like Slack, SMS, or SMTP um, for just sending like messages out to um, to some sort of like external system, uh, a messaging system uh, for uh, for an, like an alert of like, hey, this is this job finished. Here's the information. So then we have pillar modules. Um, so pillar modules are uh, they provide an external or a, a centralized system rather um, to provide secure data for salt. Um, so if you've ever used, um, I'm blanking on the name of what Puppet uses now. Not important. Um, oh, Hira, Hira. That's the, the puppet system. 
Uh, so uh, they're useful for, so, yeah, thank you, Robbie. Uh, useful for st storing secure configuration data, um, such as credentials. Um, one one caveat I will mention uh, with Pillar, it's it's very easy to uh, to overload your Pillar system. Um, so oftentimes people will they'll file issues, they'll um, file bugs, and say like, oh, my Pillar system is uh, is running, uh, my master is running low, or my like Pillar is like querying really slow. Um, it's really really easy to store way too much information in Pillar, um, and uh, it's uh, the salt master can get uh, overloaded, um, and we're talking like thousands and thousands of, of entries or thousands of lines. So just a just a little uh, bit of information there. Um, so by default, uh, the data that's stored in Pillar is uh, is typically stored on the salt master, uh, and it's stored in YAML files. Uh, so just like flat uh, key key value files um, with some like hierarchy if you want to. Um, so what external pillar modules do is a way it provides a way for you to store that pillar data in some sort of external system. Um, so uh, we have things like uh, MySQL or uh, S3, um, HashiCorp Vault. One of the ones I didn't mention here uh, is the GPG killer pillar module. Um, which allows you to store them uh, encrypted in uh, at some uh, external system or um, or uh, within the salt master itself. So then we have outputter modules. Um, so these determine the outputs um, from particular salt commands. Um, so by default, the nested outputter module is used. Um, so here's a here's just a quick example of it. Um, so if you run like a salt command, like an execution module, um, you've probably seen uh, this uh, similar output to this. Um, so very simple. Um, and some examples of, of other output or modules um, for just like getting different uh, outputs uh, is include the uh, includes the JSON module, um, the YAML, or the progress. Um, and there's there's probably like a dozen or, or so more. Um, I just listed a few. And then we have cloud modules. Um, so cloud modules, as uh, as per the name, are used to interact with the various cloud providers. Um, so we have, uh, and these are typically run using the salt cloud, salt cloud commands. And so we have uh, we have salt cloud modules for most of the major cloud providers: uh, Amazon EC2, uh, Google Cloud, Azure, DigitalOcean, OpenStack, and of course VMware. And uh, then we have beacons. Uh, so beacons are, um, of all the, the different salt module types, beacons are one of my two favorites. Um, so I just think they're really cool. So they allow various software, um, both salt components and external applications to report data into salt, um, which you can then use that information uh, to uh, put it onto the salt event bus, and you can have reactors which react. Um, so you can build yourself a um, like a basic basic monitoring system for your for your minions, um, or you can send that information off to uh, a, a different um, monitoring host or, or system, such as OpenNMS, Nagios, uh, Prometheus. Um, you can also build like a self healing system. So really cool, really cool beacons. Um, so some examples of those are uh, disk usage, uh, iNotify. Uh, so disk usage is obvious for, for monitoring uh, like your, your disk usage um, on your minions. iNotify for watching uh, like file system changes, such as files being added, deleted, etc. cetera. Um, this one actually only works on uh, Unix-like systems, so like Linux, the BSDs, OS X. Um, we do have one which went in a couple of releases ago called Watchdog um, that is really useful for Windows. It actually works on all systems, but uh, I think the iNotify one is is kind of the preferred beacon for um, for uh, like Unix Unix based systems, and the Watchdog beacon is the one for uh, Windows. Um, so we also have WTemp and, and BTemp, um, and these are really useful for monitoring um, uh, monitoring watch. Uh, Logins on on uh, Unix-based systems. Um, so I actually hear a really cool uh, example of someone using this the other day. Uh, one of our customers um, had set up the beacons, 
and they were watching uh, logins, um, and uh, they saw logins uh, within. Uh, they would use the beacons, the W temp and B temp beacon modules uh, to watch the logins, and then once they saw a login, it would fire an event that which would then query another system, which would check to see if the machine was uh, within like a uh, a maintenance window, and if it wasn't, it would log the person out, file a ticket, and then like send an alert off to like a supervisor that says like, hey, this person logged into this machine at this time when it wasn't in a maintenance window, they should probably get a talking to. Um, so it's kind of like, it's kind of like big brotherish, but I don't know, I thought it was a, I thought it was a useful kind of cool usage of it. Uh, and then finally we have the, the PS, um, PS uh, beacon. Um, which is good, useful for monitoring processes. Uh, so you can see if the processes are running or not. Uh, and then finally, we have engines. Um, so these are, of, with, along with beacons, these are my, my other favorite uh, kind of uh, module type um, with insult. Um, so they're similar to beacons. They'll, they'll monitor like uh, uh, external processes or external services. Um, so where they differentiate from beacons, whereas beacons will periodically, uh, like on a loop, every uh, 10 seconds, five seconds, um, kind of like go and pull information. Uh, engines are waiting for the information to kind of be sent to them. Um, so some examples that we have of those are uh, Docker. So the Docker one's actually really cool. Uh, you can actually have, mm, excuse me, yeah, so Docker, the Docker engine monitor Docker, uh, listening for like, connect to the Docker daemon on a host and uh, look for uh, Docker events and then add those to the event bus, the salt event bus. Um, and you can do like reactors uh, based on those events. Uh, so we also have the, uh, the Slack engine, uh, which is really useful for uh, doing like a chat ops kind of uh, usage within salt. Um, so it connects to your Slack instance and waits for uh, commands, which you can then issue to salt, um, log stash, uh, and then finally, SQS events, um, which actually connect to the SQS service in Amazon and uh, listen for those events. So uh, as I mentioned, um, we just did the silicon release, um, which is version 3004, uh, about a week or two ago. Um, so hopefully everyone's upgraded. Uh, some really cool stuff in there. Um, so I just did a quick check. Uh, the other day when preparing these slides uh, for the module counts um, that are, are available of those types. Um, and so some of these we went through, some of them we, we kind of skipped over because uh, they're kind of internal and not really used like on a daily basis by uh, when using SALT. Uh, but some of the ones we, we did mention um, that I wanted to highlight. Uh, so we had uh, modules. So those are remote execution modules. Um, the current count is 533 different unique uh, modules. And some of those fall into the, like the virtual modules category, um, but some of them are uh, quite different. Um, so you, depending on the, on the uh, whether or not dependencies are met, um, those would be available to you. Um, and also state modules. Um, so these, uh, again, used for configuration management, though that count was at 350. So based on that information, um, that the number of uh, modules that we have in SALT today, uh, you might be wondering like why, why you would want to uh, take the time to customize SALT, like what, what purpose would have, would there be um, to adding uh, an additional module? Uh, so to answer that question, look, we have to ask like a, a few more. Um, so some of the reasons why you might want to customized salt uh, is if you uh, need to support like an internal external system. Um, so salt, as we as we saw, like salt supports 500 plus different um, through the remote execution modules, uh, 500, 500 plus uh, different like applications and services um, through the states, uh, like an additional like 350, um, which some overlap with the modules, um, the remote execution modules. Uh, but it doesn't support everything out there. It doesn't support every single internal or external system that your, your company or organization might be using. 
So you also might want to replace uh, some state files with a custom module. So typically state, module, state files uh, call out to uh, state, state module functions or even some cases uh, remote execution modules, um, depending on what they're doing. So there could be calls to like pillar data or grain data um, or just like querying something based on um, using a, an external module or a, sorry, a remote execution module. Um, so depending on the complexity of the state, uh, you could replace that with a, uh, a custom module. Um, most of SALT is, is built on uh, uh, the remote execution modules anyway. So it's, it's basically state modules all the way down. Uh, you could also uh, potentially override uh, SALT modules uh, with newer versions. So if you're using a, an older version and you, you need the functionality from a newer release, um, while not officially supported and often uh, frowned upon because of uh, your mileage may vary with, with how well it works, um, you can take a, a module from a newer release and place it into an older release. Um, and probably nine times out of 10, eight times out of 10, it will work as expected, um, but we don't recommend it because of problems. Um, but that is an option. And, and that could be why you, you're looking to override a, uh, a, a cell module. Uh, so the next question would be like, what? What are you going to customize? So uh, that, again, poses like two additional questions. If you're overriding an existing salt module um, with a newer version, or if you're creating a brand new salt module. And we're going to focus on the, on the second option here, uh, the brand new salt module. So now it's the question of like, how? How do I customize salt? So again, like that, that kind of raises some additional questions. Um, so depending on how you're customizing it. If you're adding a new, like a brand new module to the SALT project, uh, these are some uh, some of the, the steps that you would likely take. Uh, so I wanted to highlight uh, one of the uh, the pieces of SALT that's included. Um, and this is different than, than the new SALT extensions um, that went into the silicon release, um, which we'll, we'll talk about in a little bit. This is a, a module that was written by a, or a, a command, I guess, a, 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 component of SALT that was written by a community member uh, probably four or five years ago um, called SALT Extend. And what this will do is will uh, you run it and you tell it the name of the, the module, the name of the module that you want to add. And it'll go ahead and set up like a basic framework of uh, the module type you want uh, within the SALT code base. Um, so typically, you would have uh, the SALT code base checked out from GitHub um, somewhere on your system. You run this command. And it would uh, kind of create the basic module in the right place for you. It would create some basic tests. I think it's still on the old old uh, run tests method. I don't believe it's been updated to PyTest. Um, but if you are interested in contributing to the SALT project, getting your, your contribution into the project, um, this would be a something to look at as a good way to, uh, to get started. Uh, so once you've added tests, to uh, to the module, um, either new tests or changed, uh, updated tests, depending on on how your uh, what your pull request looks like. Um, opening a pull request against the SALT project, and then waiting for it to be re reviewed and merged. Uh, so the new way, and it's actually the way that we're kind of suggesting that everyone go, um, is to release it separately from SALT. Um, so as I said, one of the new things that went into the silicon release uh, is the concept of salt extensions, um, and so there's a a tool uh, that uh, my one of my fellow core team members, Pedro, wrote uh, called Salt Extension, um, that will actually uh, go through, uh, actually create, um, do all the like the heavy lifting for you of creating a a salt extension kind of framework um, that you you can go in and you can create the uh, you add your functions, um, but it gives you a good starting point. Um, so one of the nice things about uh, the new method, the salt extension, is you can host it separately. So you could host it on your GitHub page. You can host it to PyPy. Um, and then you can install it, or anyone can install it via pip. 
Um, and then eventually, uh, this is the proof of concept here, the extensions.solveproject.io. Uh, but eventually, we will get to a point where uh, we will have a uh, uh, an index, a salt extensions index, where people can go and they can see what uh, available uh, uh, extensions or what what extensions are available to, to install from salt and they can see which ones work with different versions um, we'll have like uh, community ratings and comments and all that good stuff so uh, salt extensions are really cool yeah just to highlight one of the things that Wayne just said in the chat was uh, salt we uh, the core team or members of the core team actually started as a uh, kind of like us eating our own dog food or drinking our dog food champagne, I forget what the saying is, um, and using salt extensions to build out a, uh, a set of modules to work with VMware. Um, so uh, you can follow the progress over there, uh, but it's, it's uh, yeah, it's really cool. I highly su suggest checking out the, uh, the extensions. Uh, I will provide a copy of the, the slide decks after the talk, or I'll pop a like a PDF in uh, in the chat or something or community Slack. Okay, so some of the salt internals um, that we have available as we're writing our our custom modules. Um, so these are uh, I'm going to refer to them as Dunder. Um, so Dunder is just double underscore. Um, these are used extensively throughout uh, existing salt modules, um, and they make things a lot easier when when uh, dealing with uh, various things. Um, so chances are, as you're writing things, if you need to do something uh, within salt, some sort of function, some sort of uh, functionality, uh, it's been done and is callable using one of these uh, these uh, Dunder, uh, Dunder variables. Uh, so the first one is Dunder context. Um, and these are available in uh, execution modules, state modules, beacons, um, and proxy minions. Uh, and they persist across, uh, when you're running them in state runs, uh, they persist across uh, the execution of all the states during a state run. And when you're running them uh, with execution modules, they're available uh, until the modules are refreshed, uh, or basically like on each module run. So one of the examples um, of this in use, that's on my next slide, oh yeah, is uh, so within the, the file or the CP module, uh, we use a class called file client um, that in some cases will do authentication depending on where it's pulling uh, its, its file from. Um, and rather than do that authentication every time, because chances are it's the same authentication, um, it will uh, authenticate it once, store something in Dunder context, and then each time it's able to use it, and it doesn't have to authenticate every time. Uh, another useful another useful case uh, of Dunder context in use is uh, within the, the package module, or package modules, um, since these are virtual modules. Uh, when you're installing uh, modules or listing them out, um, oftentimes you will get a uh, like an updated list, uh, so it'll refresh the available packages. Uh, if you're doing this a lot, um, which oftentimes happens within the package module, you don't necessarily want to have it go out and and pull down like a listed or a, an update or a refreshed package list. Um, so within the package module, it will actually go and do an update store that available list in Dunder context, and that way it can easily refer to it uh, quickly without having to go and refresh uh, each time. And then the final use is within uh, the salt proxy minions. Um, so when they initially start up and they, they log into the devices. So proxy minions, uh, for those that don't know or haven't used them, are really useful for uh, devices where you can't run a traditional salt minion. Uh, so like, some uh, network switches or routers, or uh, there's even a proxy minion to run uh, salt against hue lights, um, if you're into that. Uh, so with, with the devices where it's logging into uh, routers and switches, uh, you don't necessarily want it or need it to log in 
uh, every time. Um, and so we can store the, uh, the connection information in Dunder context. Um, and then when we need it, we can pull it out um, and uh, don't have to log into the, the device each time. So within, uh, in most salt modules um, that, that people are going to potentially be writing custom modules for, um, you have access to Dunder grains. Uh, and these are really useful for uh, when you want to uh, determine like what your module should do based on the on the different system. Um, so everything that your everything, every grain that your minion, every grain that has information about your minion is within Dunder grains, um, and the contents of it when it's run against your minion or your module uh, is based on the minion where the module or modules are running. Uh, so we also have Dunder Ops, um, and this is one of the probably most used within modules. Um, it's available in all modules. Uh, and it contains all the configuration options uh, for the uh, the master or the minion where, where the module is running. Um, and the contents are based on where the module is running. So if you're running it against a minion, it's, it's going to have that minion's Dunder Ops. Uh, alternatively, in some cases, it's it's better to use the uh, the Dunder Salt uh, config uh, to call the config.get function um, from Dunder Salt. And I had a really good reason in my notes, uh, but I can't see it at the moment. So if one of my if Wayne or, or possibly Eric remembers offhand why the reasoning for this, just drop it in the chat, please. Uh, so we also have Dunder Pillar. Um, so these are available in uh, execution modules, state modules, runners, uh, or sorry, returners, proxy minions, and grains. Um, and these contain the pillar data for the respective minion where the module or modules are running. Uh, so some examples of pillar at work. Um, so these would be uh, like secure configuration values for execution modules, um, as well as connection information for um, proxy minions. Um, so oftentimes, you'll, you'll within a lot of the modules, uh, you'll see it querying for pillar um, for like log information, like credentials. Um, so some good examples of this would be like the MySQL modules or um, Postgres, like anything that's logging into into a uh, some sort of external system um, vault. As a good example, um, where you want to pull the, the credential information, the login information, but you don't necessarily want to have that stored in uh, in the configuration on the minion itself. You want it somewhere secure. And of course, we have Dunder Salt. Um, so this is probably used everywhere. Um, it is used everywhere within Salt, uh, within Salt modules. Um, so this contains all, uh, all the functions uh, for the remote execution modules, that particular minion, um, that the particular minion uh, has access to. So depending on the, um, depending on the, uh, the dependencies or the libraries available, um, this is those, uh, those modules, those functions will be in Dunder Salt. Uh, and some of the most common used most used functions in, in custom modules are typically uh, things like CMD run um, or config.get or the file module is used quite extensively. So one of the lesser lesser used ones um, that I've seen within the code base um, is actually Dunder States. Um, and it's actually really cool um, because it gives you access to uh, state modules within other state modules. Um, so if you're doing something um, like writing a custom module and you need access to uh, or need to do something that a, a current state module already does, um, you can actually reuse that state module within your state module um, or your execution module if you need to set the state. Um, so some common uses for uh, for Dunder states within execution modules is uh, installing packages um, that are needed to run like a particular state. Um, so I've used, I've seen that used uh, uh, in, in a couple cases, uh, but generally they're only used um, 
within state modules. Um, so we also have the Dunder virtual, um, and it's not, this is uh, not required within your, um, within your modules, um, but it's highly recommended and, and considered best practice. Um, so this is the, this is the function that is, this is executed uh, when salt, when the salt menu uh, starts up. Um, so the salt loader will go through um, all the modules um, within the system and kind of look at this this function um, and it acts as the gatekeeper uh, for determining whether or not a module should be loaded and made available um, so typically you'll see in here um, uh, checks for particular libraries being installed or uh, particular binaries on the system um, and if those binaries or libraries exist then you then the module will return or the virtual the thunder virtual function will return true um, and it will be loaded and available on the salt minion. Uh, if it's not, it will return false and it won't be uh, made available. Um, and optionally, you can provide the name of, uh, you can use it to provide the name of the module. Um, so if you, uh, some examples would be, I think the, uh, so like, uh, well, virtual modules. Um, so virtual modules, uh, so like app, apps package, um, the, the name of the module, the actual name of the file within the code base is apt package or apt pkg.py, but its virtual name, excuse me, its virtual name is package. So it overrides it. So within like any of your custom modules, if you name it like a specific name, but want it to respond or be available um, using a different name within salt, setting the virtual name and then returning that in the virtual, the under virtual function, um, you can override that. Um, and so one of the useful, and finally, one of the useful um, aspects of Dunder Virtual uh, is what's known as virtual aliases. Um, so these went in uh, 2018, 2019 release, I believe, one of those. Um, and so they allow your module to, to respond to multiple names. Um, so if you have a module which uh, had a name um, or was using a name and you, you wanted to rename it or deprecate the old name, uh, you could set a virtual alias and uh, then it would respond to both names. And so you could, you could create a, yourself a deprecation path to, uh, to say, okay, in, in uh, whatever release or in two releases from now, this, this old name will go away and use the new name, but it will allow people to use the old name in the, uh, in the time being. Okay, so now is the, the dangerous part of the talk. We're actually gonna look at some code. Uh, so first, the first thing I wanted to look at was actually running um, and creating a, um, a, salt, exen a salt extension. Um, so as you can see on the screen here, I have a, uh, there's no way I was gonna remember this and type it out. Uh, the, the command that you use to create uh, a salt extension. Um, so we will look at the help and just see what available, what options are available for it. Um, so we can set uh, our author name, um, which I've done here. Uh, we can set our, our email address. We can do a summary. We can set a URL. Um, I typically use just like a GitHub, um, GitHub URL. Uh, tracker URL, I guess that would be like, if you're using some other tracking system, um, documentation URL, uh, package name. Um, so I've only used the, the ones that I've, I've mentioned up here uh, so far. Um, and then loader, so these are the different types of modules that you can, um, you can create within uh, using an extension. Um, so it's pretty much everything. Um, every type of module that we have, some of them that we talked about, some of them that we didn't. Um, and so you, you provide your information, your, um, your license, very important. Um, and then your, uh, your, we did add that. Sorry, this is one of the, the one of the earlier versions of, uh, create salt extension, um, that Pedro created didn't have the destination directory. 
um, option. And so when you ran it, it would just dump everything you you were doing inside its uh, inside the current directory. Um, and so I had to go th several times. I forgot and had to go through and uh, create or, or go through and clean up like the, 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 all the stuff that had created. So uh, really good to see that is there. Um, but we'll just go ahead and create uh, the uh, the directory that we're going to have our salt extension in. Okay, so creating that, we're running that command. Um, so this will go through and uh, create uh, all the different files that we need to uh, to run an extension or to create an extension. So we have uh, what's look pretty standard if you're if you've looked at the code base or the salt code base. Uh, so you've got your docs directory, you got your license. Got your Knox file, um, which is useful for writing tests. Um, we have our source and uh, our test directory or test directory. Uh, so we uh, we get a warning here or just kind of a uh, FYI message um, that uh, it's including um, loader.py um, if we're using uh, salts. Um, uh, versions below 3003. Um, so we don't want necessarily uh, it to, we don't want to support 3003 or lower. Um, we just want to do the latest. So we're going to remove that. And this will also not uh, have salts um, or not have the extension install uh, any, uh, or not install the salt version um, while we're installing it. Uh, so looking at the, the setup uh, that it's generated, so this would be some of the things I wanted to highlight. This would be where you would say uh, any additional uh, any additional uh, software uh, packages that you want to to include within uh, when someone's installing your um, your software. Um, so when the when you're running the setup, or and then when you're doing the the actual install, um, so you can include additional uh, Python packages here uh, that you wanted to make sure were installed that were required. So like a good example was, uh, would be, um, I'm in the process of re, uh, reworking our, our Kubernetes support within Salt. And so I'm moving it to a Salt extension. So within the setup.cfg for the Salt extension that I'm creating, I include uh, both in setup requirements and install requirements, Kubernetes. Um, so that way if someone, or the Kubernetes Python library uh, and that way, when someone in installs that extension, they get uh, Kubernetes installed as well, and so the functions. Okay, so going into the uh, the source directory, that uh, the the create salt extensions uh, binary created or the command created, uh, we have our uh, salt extension directory, and this is just the standard layout. Um, that the, the salt extensions uh, follow. Um, and so within the salt extensions directory, we have a file or a directory called hello, uh, which is the name of the the module that we told to create salt extensions, uh, the name that we're going to, um, that it's going to have. So within hello, we have a directory called help modules. So because we told it only that we only want to create a, a remote execution module, it only created that modules directory. So then within there, we have a, a command called hello mod. So one of the things I wanted to point out was uh, the name of the file here is called hello mod, but the module that we told it to create was called hello. So it's added a virtual name here so that when we install this and use this with salt, it will respond to the name hello. So we're just gonna create, just kind of clean this up a little bit. Hello world. Okay, looks good. So within our module here, um, we have our, our Dunder virtual. So this is what the salt loader will look for when it's uh, initially loading our module. No requirements, uh, so it just it just loads it and returns the the virtual name here. 
uh, called hello. And then we have one function that we call world, and it's going to run, um, that errors. it's going to run, uh, it's going to make a, a call out to Dunder Salt, um, and it's going to use the, the uh, command test.echo and hello world. So before we can install this, uh, we need to whoops, get it. We need to make sure we set up all the Git stuff um, so that Pimp can install it. Just give it a second. So now we have a. Um, We've installed the, the, the Hello World um, salt module within our, uh, our salt uh, system. And one of the nice things about uh, in the silicon release, oops, I always get that wrong, especially when doing it live, uh, is we can see here um, that we can get within our version report, we can now get a list of salt extensions. Um, so these are some of the ones that I played around with. Um, so here's our here's our hello world um, function. So now when we call it, we should get hello world. Uh, looks like we're almost out of time. But one of the final things I wanted to show. Um, Actually, uh, we discovered last week, purely by accident, actually. Um, so I created this little salt extension called uh, File Extra. Uh, so one of the one of the really cool things about the extensions uh, is uh, you can see blah blah blah. So I have a uh, one called uh, Hello World, or sorry, Hello World File Underscore Mod. Uh, and as we as we talked about during the during the earlier, uh, there already exists a, a hello mod or a hello mod file file mod file module. Uh, and so, my module here is uh, not the full file module, um, but I've created just like a simple uh, empty dir um, uh, function, um, which just goes through and deletes like everything in the directory. And so having this installed, because there already exists a, a module, um, it doesn't override the whole thing. It just adds in my empty dir function. So I can have this installed and continue using the uh, existing module, the existing file module, um, and get updates to it and bug fixes and whatnot as part of like regular salt releases. But having my own extension here, I can also override any additional functions that that I want that are, are missing from um, from the uh, from the file module. So, something I wanted to point out. Uh, and I think we're out of time. I don't know if we have any time for any questions. If there was questions, Patrick, looking at you. Yeah, so there is one from um, Robbie Calicote in uh, in Q and A. What is the best practice for writing tests for custom states and modules? I usually end up just mocking the module function output with pytests mocker dot patch dot object. Um, yeah, no, I mean that that sounds like a good approach. I mean, depending on the the module. Um, so I guess I'll, I, I two things to say on that. Like depending on the module, um, unit tests are unit tests are good. Integration tests or functional tests are better. Um, obviously, like depending on what it's doing, you can't necessarily uh, always test the scenario um, in a, in like a real real life situation. Um, so. Yeah, I would also recommend, I think Wayne mentioned it um, in the chat as well, like attending Wayne's testing clinic. Um, he goes through like on a weekly, I think it's weekly basis, um, at least weekly basis, uh, writing tests, um, 
for well existing modules. Um, but as we do more and more salt extensions, I, I imagine he'll get into writing um, writing tests for custom modules. Um, so I hopefully that answered your question, Robbie. Cool. Any other questions, anybody? Wayne mentioned in chat that he often discusses the distinction and trade-offs between unit functional integration tests. Um, does the one thing I will on? say, Go sorry, one thing I will say, like we are, uh, um, we are moving uh, towards moving all of the tests uh, over to PyTest. Um, so just a quick plug, if anyone if anyone is itching for like any sort of way to contribute to SALT, um, helping us port those tests over to PyTest would be greatly appreciated. Um, but the other thing I was going to say about, about the tests, um, writing functional tests within PyTest is really, really easy. Um, I've moved a few integration tests over to uh, functional tests, um, and they run they run so much faster and then so much more efficient, um, and they ju they're just easier to read and and process and update. Um, so, like, highly highly recommend writing functional tests over over integration tests. Um, and again, like unit tests are good, but they don't give you the like a real life. Um, they they test the Python functionality. They don't test the the actual usage against um, the underlying system. Right. Okay. And um, Stephen Fielding clarifies in chat with Wayne um, whether or not the extension wheel needs to be installed. Um, yes, currently it does. And at least currently, the minion uh, process requires a restart after installing the extension modules. Um, whether or not we need to still do that as of silicon uh, remains to be seen. No, I think that was one of the things that one of the last things that got into silicon was you do not need to um, you do not need to restart your minion once uh, when an extension is is installed or updated. Perfect. Okay, um, just um, one last follow up, Gareth. Um, we mentioned making the slide deck available. Um, my oh yeah. Advice because we're going to lose the session itself. Um, would be to address that in the community Slack. Um, maybe we just choose a channel that we want to throw that in. And then um, for my own nefarious purposes, that drives people into the community Slack, um, which in turn draws them into contributing to the project. So um, actually that's good for Gareth too. Yeah, for sure. I am doing that right now. I'm downloaded as, uh, as a PDF. Went somewhere, I assume. Oh, yep, there it is. Yeah, so um, just looking in our waning seconds here, because we have five minutes until the next session starts, um, just looking at what else is out there. Um, there is mention of Tiamat. Um, so Tom Hatch is about to give his talk um, specifically on a, an in-depth look. Uh, I'm sorry, that is um, Idem. His Tiamat talk is later today at um, One Mountain. Um, yes, there is also an Eric Johnson session on uh, orchestration use case of deploying open source paste bin. Uh, and then there's also managing windows with salt stack config on uh, the part of um, VMware's Vincent Riccio and Dale Hassinger. Um, so by all means, feel free to attend any of those. Um, I'm sorry, Gareth, did we lock down the, the uh, community Slack portion of, of surfacing those slides? Uh, I don't think so. Let's, um, I mean, maybe we can just throw that in general or something. Oh, you can't create a channel? We could create a channel. Do we already have one for extensions? I don't think so. I was just going to create a salt comp 21. Yeah, let's do channel. that. 
All right. Um, so we'll do that. Um, we'll see you guys for anybody that, that has any additional questions for Gareth or um, wants to do the follow-up for any of the slide deck and, and other information. Um, so we will toss in a, a SaltConf21 channel into the community Slack. Um, if you don't know how to get there, I will momentarily um, supply the uh, Heroku app link in the general event chat in just a moment so that it doesn't disappear when the session does. Um, hope to see you guys at the next sessions. Enjoy the rest of your uh, your last what, final three sessions of SaltConf. Do please uh, attend the networking sessions as well. Um, my manager refers to it as nerd speed dating. It's more fun than it sounds like. And it's, um, you know, as of all the random meeting people online, um, this probably gives you the, the most common interests possible. Thanks, everybody. Yep. Thank you, everyone. That's right.